Good morning. What a beautiful day God has blessed us with today. Um, I don't know if it's going to stick around, but it sure seems like spring is here, doesn't it? How many of y'all missed that hour of sleep last night? How many of you forgot this morning? Just a few. Yeah, very good. Very good. I, we went to bed early just preparing, so um, got in bed early there. But we're glad that you're here. Uh, let me give you a few announcements. Uh, Hopefully this will be the last Sunday where the bathrooms will not be open. Uh, again, guys, go to the fellowship hall. Ladies, there is a restroom in the, um, uh, in the office area there. The rest of them in this building are closed. Uh, hopefully we'll have the, the men's finished uh, by this week, the end of this week, and we'll be able to open those back up. If you have a chance to just glance in there, it really looks nice. They're getting close to finishing it. Uh, on a sad note, I wanted you to be aware of a couple of funerals that we have this week. Uh, first of all, Nancy Gray passed away a few months ago, but this was the first opportunity for us to do a service for her, and that will be tomorrow at 1 o'clock at National Cemetery. Uh, if you have an opportunity to come, we encourage you to be there for Nancy's funeral. And then Robert Hancock passed away this past week and will be buried at National as well, and that funeral will be Friday at 1 o'clock. So we wanted you to be aware of those two. And just a couple of events coming up. We've made mention of our Passover Seder demonstration that we're going to have on the 28th. Uh, Reginald Lizenby will be here and will do that for us. And really what we're going to do is we look at the elements of the Passover. We're going to see the connection that they have with the Lord's Supper and Jesus fulfillment in all of them. So it's going to be an incredible time. We will take the Lord's Supper up. That is the 28th of this month. And then don't forget Easter is on April 4th this year. And for those of you who are watching online, make that maybe as a goal to come back. Uh, if you've been gone with COVID, uh, God is protecting us. It seems like things are getting so much better now. So we would, what a great day to be able to come together and celebrate on Easter, which is again, April 4th. Let's pray and uh, then we will get into our worship time. Father, thank you again for the joy of the Lord. Thank you for today. Lord, thank you that uh, we woke up. We have another day of life. We have another day to serve you. And we get to start this day by just coming into the presence of the living God. And according to your word, you promised that where two or three are gathered, there you are in their midst. So you're here. If we don't sense your presence, it's more on us than it is you. You're here. And I pray that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us, that you would bless us. But God, if you need to challenge and rebuke us, do that as well. So Father, we open our heart to you right now, every one of us. We open our heart and say, God, do whatever you want to in my life and in our church today. And Lord, I pray that when I preach in a little while, I do not preach with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Holy Spirit, would you take over now, and would you do what only you can do? Change hearts and lives today. Feed us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing praises to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Freedom. 
has done great things. I'm going to read from Psalm, this is 104. Praise to the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent, and he lays the beams of his upper chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It cannot be moved. You covered it with watery depths as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down to the valleys, to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. And further down in the chapter, verse 31, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. But may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. We're going to sing now an old hymn called, O Worship the King. Worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Tell of his might, oh sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space. His chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. To full care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the Children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee to we trust, nor find thee to fear. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker. tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and a friend. The words of that old hymn remind us of what he is for us. He is our creator. There's nothing in this universe that he has not created. He is our defender. He is our redeemer. He took us from a life of sin and death because of what we chose and gave us his name, his family, his blood when he washed it on the cross. my mind to 
Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by a heavy stone beside us still children as your bride. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
instrument, your instrument on this world that needs you so desperately. God, give us a heart for you, a desire for you. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen. You know, as I look at so many Christians in their walk with Christ today, it just seems like a lot of them just seem to be missing something. 
I'd see in so many of them, I, I, I can see them every Sunday, and it just seems like a lot of Christians are just going through the motions. You just kind of sit here, you just kind of read your word every once in a while, you kind of pray, but it never really does anything in your life. I see so many too that I, I and I'm just going to use the term, who just seem to be bipolar, spiritually speaking. They're up and then they're down. They're madly in love with Christ one day, and the next day you can hardly even tell that they know Him. One day is high, and the next day is low, and just to be real honest with you, I feel that way at times as well. Sometimes I just feel like something just isn't right in my relationship with Christ. Other times I feel like I'm on a roller coaster. Sometimes it's really good, and sometimes it just seems really bad. And the question that came to me is, why is that? What's wrong with us? One of the things that I love about Scripture is its honest portrayal of people. Not everyone in Scripture is on the mountaintop all the time. In fact, it's really the opposite. It just seems like so many of them are just down in the valley like we are. They're real people, and they're people that we can relate to. And many of them, as I read Scripture, seem to be bipolar spiritually as well. Think about Peter. In Matthew chapter 16, He makes the incredible declaration to Christ in front of others. You are Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commends him for that and says that that you didn't come up with that on your own. Uh, That was something given to you by the Father. He has revealed that to you. In other words, Peter got it. He understood. And he even says later in Luke chapter 22, he looks at Christ and he says, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Man, he was on the top. But then you know what happened later on in that same chapter. He denies Jesus three different times. He couldn't stand strong. He did desert him. And what I thought was was really sad was it says that after he declares openly that he never knows this man, the third time he does it, he looks over there and Jesus is looking right at him. And it says that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. He was broken. Man, he went from the top of the mountain, and real quick, he went to the deepest, darkest valley. Does that sound familiar to you? Does it kind of sound like your walk and mine? The good thing is Peter kind of had a bipolar thing going on as well. So did Paul. If you have your Scripture with me, turn with me to Romans chapter 7. Now, I know there are different interpretations of this passage of whether he's talking about his pre-Christian days or his Christian days, but I believe that he's talking about him as a believer, and listen to what he says. Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 14. Paul writes, and he says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. You ever get there? You ever wonder, I just don't get it, God. Why am I doing this? For what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate, that's what I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do not do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. He didn't understand himself. He didn't get it why the very good that he wanted to do, he didn't do, but the thing that he hated, that's what he ended up doing. 
And, and it just seems like, man, I can't get this consistent thing down. I can't consistently make right decision. And he finally declares, what a wretched man that I am. Two of the biggest names of all time in Christianity struggled with the Christian life as well. Something seemed to be missing at times. They kind of had a bipolar thing going on too. So what's wrong with us? Why can't we seem to walk more consistently? Why do we seem to be so up and then so down, and oftentimes the downs seem to outweigh the good times? Why can't we live this Christian life the way that we know we're supposed to live it, the way we see it in others, the way we read it about it in Scripture? And sometimes, where is the joy? Where is the peace? Where is the life that it promises? Why can't we seem to get it down? Why can't we seem to grow in Christ's likeness? What's wrong with us? Well, that's what we're going to discuss over the next few weeks. And I want to begin by just letting you know right off the beginning what I believe the issue is. Here it is. Here's the key. We have to move from just believing in Jesus to becoming his disciple. We need to move from knowing all about him to knowing and experiencing him intimately daily. We must move him from being a compartment in our life or just a small part of our life to being our life. And what we're going to learn is that becoming a Christian, first of all, it is a free gift. You never can get around that. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for it is by grace through faith that you are saved. That's not of yourselves. It's a gift from God, not by works, so no one can boast. We are saved by grace. Amen? Amen. But please hear me. Even though we are freely saved, nothing to do with ourselves, when you become a Christian, it costs you everything. The great Christian pastor Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who uh, was killed at the hands of the Nazis, said this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That's the paradox of the Christian life, church. To really experience life, to get it, to live this Christian life, it means we die to self. It means something else takes place in our life. And until we get that, we will never live it the way that it's supposed to be lived. You see, being a Christian is more than going to church on Sunday morning. It is more than saying your blessing at the meals that you eat. It is more than putting a $20 bill in the plate. It is more than knowing great stories of the Bible like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or, 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 or the feeding of the 5,000 or David and Goliath. It's more than knowing those stories. It is to live moment by moment as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, there is a difference between simply believing in Him and what the Bible calls being a disciple. Now, what I want to do as we begin is I want to share some of the differences of what I see, the difference between, and this is what I'm meaning when I say the difference between a believer and a disciple. Number one, a believer lives to please himself while a disciple lives to please God. You see, for a believer, it tends to be all about what makes them happy. It's all about the emotions and feelings of this life. And if they don't feel it, they don't, they're not going to do it. On the other hand, a disciple is going to do it no matter what. A disciple is all about living to exalt Jesus Christ, not themselves. Secondly, a believer finds, now listen to this, especially young people. A believer finds their identity in what they do. A disciple finds their identity in their relationship with Christ. Now, folks, this is one of the reasons I think one of the biggest reasons of why the Christian life is such a roller coaster for so many. When we find our identity in what we do, if we're doing good, we're on the high. If we're not doing good, we're on a low. And so every time we do good, we go up. Every time we do bad, we go back down. And the roller coaster ride continues. We have to find our identity in Christ, not in who we are, not what we do. It is in who we are in Christ. Third, a believer loves the Word, but mainly the blessings of the Word, and tends to ignore the challenges of it. 
They kind of pick and choose what they want to read and what they want to live by. A disciple gets into the Word and desires to know the whole counsel of the Word of God, whether it's difficult or not, and even whether they agree with it or not. Fourth, a believer sees the church as a convenient place to gather and hear the Word of God. A disciple sees the church as a family necessary for being able to live out the Word of God. There's a difference between just listening to it and actually doing it, and that's the difference that I'm saying between just simply a believer and a disciple. Fifth, a believer serves God out of duty when it is convenient. A disciple serves God out of love even when it costs him. Sixth, a believer seeks to impress God with their religiousness. They go to church and they pray and they read the Bible to kind of get some brownie points with God so that they can get greater blessings. A disciple seeks to know God through relationship. It's all about relationship, not doing. It's not trying to impress God because they realize they can't impress God. And seventh, a believer lives for the things of God and the things of this world. A disciple's life is focused on the kingdom of God and nothing else. And I think 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 puts it great. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. See, one of the reasons we're so bipolar is because we really do want to love God, but at the same time, we want to love the things of the world. We want to strive for those things. And, and Scripture says you can't do both. You've you got to choose one or the other. It says, for everything in the world, the, pri- uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now listen, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Folks, there are so many differences between being just simply a believer, somebody who knows about God, versus a disciple, someone who is in love with God. And so many are just simply living as a believer. What I wanted to give to you there was just kind of a brief sketch so we can begin to see that there is a a major difference between the two. So the point here that I'm trying to make is this. Jesus does not want us to just be a believer. He wants us to be a disciple. And the reason so many are bipolar and seem to be missing so much is because they've stopped at being just a believer. They're not following through with what Christianity is all about, and that's being a disciple, a learner, and a follower of Jesus Christ day by day by day. Becoming a consistent, maturing disciple is the key to getting off the roller coaster, the ups and downs of the Christian life. It is the key to overcoming our bipolar tendencies. It is the key to experiencing all of Christ in our life, which then leads to truly living the way that we know we're supposed to be living. Really living as a disciple will bring us the life that we've longed for our entire existence with Christ. Now, with that said, what I want to do with the rest of my sermon time is to lay the foundation before we begin looking at the qualities of a disciple. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at 10 qualities of a disciple. If you want to know what a disciple of Christ is, if you want to know who it is that really follows Christ, these are going to be the characteristics of your life. But Let me lay a foundation before we get there. Because if we don't lay this foundation, we're going to continue to be bipolar and continue to be up and down in our Christian life, even as we strive to be a disciple. Here's the foundation. The disciple-led life is not about performance, but about abiding. And yes, I've said the last two weeks, we looked at 2 Peter, and it said, make every effort to be holy and godly. But unless we are careful, we can turn that into legalism, and we're right back where we started. So yes, it is going to take great work, great effort on our part, but how and why we put the effort into it is so important. So I want you to turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15.
I encourage you to read this entire chapter. I'm going to focus on verses 4 through 10 and just briefly go through them. I'm going to read it first in the NIV, and then I'm going to read it in the message paraphrase. Verse 4 and following. Remain in me, Jesus said, or abide in me, as I also abide in you. For no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me, and if I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do, what's the next word? Nothing. That's what we're missing in our Christian life, folks. When we try to do it, not connected into Christ, we are doing nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, now listen to this, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. There's the phrase. Showing yourself to be my disciple. To be a true disciple of Christ means you must abide in Christ. You must always be connected into him or you cannot do this Christian life called being a disciple. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now, remain in my love. Now, how? If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now, I wanted to read this in the message paraphrase. I just like the way that Eugene Patterson kind of interprets this. Live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you're joined with me. I'm the vine and you're the branches. When, when, we're joined with, when you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from, from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on a bonfire. If you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is, how, this is how my Father shows who He is. When you produce grapes, you are mature as my disciples. I have loved you the way my Father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you can meet, keep my commandments, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done keep my Father's commands, and made myself at home in His love. I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy, and your joy wholly mature. I love the way that he puts it there. The foundation for the disciple is by abiding in Christ. Now, I thought it was interesting that that phrase, abide in Him, is a present tense imperative which means present tense is to be ongoing. It's not just something you do every once in a while. When you feel like it, you connect into him. When you go to church, you connect into him. No, it's to be ongoing. It's a present tense. It is an imperative as well, which means it's a must. There's no other way around it. You cannot truly live as a disciple unless you abide in Christ. Now, the word abide itself means to remain, as the NIV puts it. It means to live in, to live through to be at home with, to dwell in, or to be joined into. And the everyday picture that Jesus gives is of a vine with its branches. And he says Jesus is the vine, he's the trunk, and we as Christians are the branches connected into him. Therefore, we grow and have our life from him. And this is how we are to live the Christian life, by connecting into him and then allowing his life and all that he has to flow into our life. Therefore, it is not about performance. It's not about doing more for God. It's not about working harder to be able to do it. It is about a constant connection into Christ. 
Where we are to try hard, where we are to put as much maximum effort into is simply to abide within Him so that Jesus' life is what is flowing through us. Now, I minored in forestry in college. And one of the things that we learn is about what comes up through the roots into the trunk or the vine, into the branches are called the xylem and the phloem. That's just simply the food and the water. It's the nutrients. All of it comes up through the roots, into the trunk, into the branches. The only responsibility of the branch is what? Stay connected into the vine. And as long as it does, it gets everything the vine has. Jesus is our vine. And all He is and all that He has flows into us. Just stay connected. Don't try to do it on your own. If you do, you will fail every time. In fact, he says you're going you're gonna to be, if you're trying to do it on your own, not connected to him, you're going to be like a branch that's just laying on the ground. That, that branch is going to wither and it's going to die. It's going to fade away. Folks, this is why we get bipolar and are missing so much. We are not connected into the vine the way that we should be. So if you want to be a disciple, if you want to get off the roller coaster ride, if you want to stop missing something in your Christian life, then abide in Christ, live through that connection into Him, His life flowing into you, you will be then a disciple, and you'll be able to live the Christian life the way that you're supposed to. And when you do, you're going to know it. How? He tells us here. Let me give you five things very quickly. Number one, you will produce fruit in your life. He says it a number of times, but in verse 5, he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Fruit will come out of your life. Inward fruit, like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and faithfulness. That's what's going to be building in your life, that inner fruit. How many of y'all would like to have more love in your life? Then be connected into Jesus Christ. If you want more peace, if you want more joy, then connect into Him. If you'd like to be more patient, be more kind. Don't try harder to get those things in your life. Just try harder to stay connected into Christ. Those are His attributes, and they will then flow into you. But you'll produce external fruit as well. You'll begin to go to church and read your Bible and pray, not because you have to and to get brownie points from God, but simply because that's where you relate with God. That's where you get to know Him. That's where you grow with Him. And you begin to do it out of a love relationship, and you'll begin to see people saved. You will begin to share your faith because not because you have to, but because you cannot not do it. You are so in love with Jesus Christ that you've got to tell everybody about Him. When you are truly a disciple who abides in Christ, you will bear fruit. Secondly, you'll have more joy in your life. Verse 11, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Your joy may be full. Your joy may be overflowing. We get the joy of Christ in our life when we abide in Him. Are you experiencing that joy? A good indication that you are really connected into the vine is you will have a joy in your life. And listen to me, even when things aren't going the way you want them to, God will fill you with joy. Do you want joy? Then get connected into Christ. Next, you'll see answers to prayer. Verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you, for you. That's a promise from God. I think one of the reasons so many of us just feel like our prayers are hitting the ceiling, probably because they are. We're trying to do it on our own. We're not connected into the vine. We're laying on the ground there, and we're withering away when God just says, connect into me, and everything you pray for will be given to you. Are you seeing answers to prayer? (coughs) When you're connected into Christ, you will, because you're going to be praying His will. Next, you will experience more love for others. Verse 12 and 13, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than they lay down their life for one's friends. You will begin to love other people the way that you should. 
In other words, life's not going to be about you anymore. It's not going to be about me. It's going to be about other people. When we are abiding in Christ and being the disciple that we should be, love will fill our hearts and we will begin to serve other people. And lastly, you will develop a friendship with God. Verse 13 and 14, greater love has no one than this, to lay down the one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Incredible that we can have a friendship with God Himself. That's what comes as a disciple when we abide in Christ. So, as we abide in Christ, we can then follow Jesus Christ the way that we should. We will live when we live as a disciple. All these awesome things will begin to be produced in our life. And folks, we're going to get off the roller coaster ride. We're going to stop being bipolar. and We're going to start climbing in our relationship with Christ. And we're going to start experiencing everything we're supposed to because we're connected into him. And his life is flowing through us. Let's pray. Father, first of all, forgive me for trying to do things on my own. Father, forgive me for just trying to get brownie points with you, doing things because I know I'm supposed to. Lord, I pray that you would change my heart. And Lord, I would put everything I have into just abiding in you moment by moment by moment. And Lord, that your life would live through me. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Lord, I pray that we would be willing to die to self, and Lord, as we do, that real life would overtake us. God, help us to get off this roller coaster existence of thinking everything this whole world revolves around us it doesn't it revolves around you and father when we stay connected into you we're going to start seeing people the way that we're supposed to we're going to start seeing ourselves the way that we should and we're going to start seeing you the way that we should as well but if you're here today and you've never accepted what jesus christ has done for you you're not connected into him at all. And my challenge to you would be to accept him as your Lord and Savior, to surrender your life and your heart to him, to say, God, I'm tired of trying to do this on my own. I'm tired of not being connected into you. I want to experience all of you. And so I invite you into my life right now. I give you my heart. I encourage you to do that. That's the beginning point. That's the beginning of a journey that you'll never, ever will fade away. And we'll just keep getting better and better and better. Father, I pray that we would stop on the roller coaster ride of life. And there would be a consistency in our walk with you every day. We cannot do it, just like Paul said, but... When we let you live through us, we can. So Lord, challenge us every day when we get up. Even this week, God, the first thing we do is, Lord, I'm connecting into you right now. I want you to live through me today. I want your words to fill my mouth. I want your thoughts to fill my mind. I want you to, to use my hands and my feet in everything that I do. May it be for your glory. And Lord, as we do, may we become disciples who then make disciples. Lord, would you speak to our heart? Would you just ask God to speak to you right now and ask him, God, what do you want me to do? Lord, I heard 
But Lord, I don't want to just be a hearer of the word. I want to be a doer of the word. What do you want me to do with what I've heard today? I just pray for more consistency for myself that I will choose to abide every moment of every night and not just when I feel like it or think that I need you I need you all the time God help me to begin every day with surrender to you and Lord I pray for this as a church that Jesus you will fill this church that we will as a church abide in you and you will flow through this church everything that we do. Father, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand together as we sing our invitation. Our invitation is always for anyone who needs to receive Christ to come and pray, recommit their life, to join our church. But I encourage you, if you just want to make a decision at your, at your pew, you can do that. But there's something about coming to an altar and getting on your knees and humbling yourself before God that kind of solidifies it in your own mind and heart. And so if you need to do that, I encourage you to. We'll be down here to receive you if you need to make a decision for Christ or somebody to pray with as we sing.
God, I just, um, I pray that over the next few weeks as we dig into what it means to be a a disciple of yours, God, that uh, we would really take the time to examine our own lives and uh, examine whether we truly are your disciple or whether we're just a believer. Um, God, and I just pray that, uh, pray that you would continue to deal with hearts this morning, even as we leave this place, God, work in our lives. We love you so much. We pray these things in your son's holy name.